Hi, Mom. What are you doing today? Providence Place, owned by the Sisters of Providence, an ideal rental setting for retirees to continue their active, independent lifestyles. We have bright one and two bedroom apartments, a magnificent chapel with daily mass, restaurant style dining, and wellness and entertainment programs. Call for a tour, 413-534-9700. Mom, call me when you're not so busy. Coming up on this edition of Real to Real. 2,000 years after the birth of the Savior, Catholics in Western Massachusetts continue to honor the Christ child. I'm Rebecca Drake and I'll have the story. Providence Ministries for the Needy celebrating 60 years serving the community here in Holyoke with a new leader at the helm. I'm Kathy Harrington and I'll have that story. And the pandemic is not stopping pro-life supporters from marking the annual March for Life. These stories and more are coming up next on Real to Real. Hello and welcome again to Real to Real. Although pro-life marchers will not be peacefully gathering in Washington, D.C. this year to mark the 48th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, the controversial 1973 Supreme Court decision legalizing abortion in the United States, that doesn't mean their commitment has waned. Typically, thousands of pilgrims head down to Washington in January for the annual pro-life march, but this year, the march is virtual. Carolee McGrath spoke to some local parishioners who make this trip each year, learning why and how they're continuing a pro-life witness locally. Usually in January, Deacon Jose Correa of Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish in Holyoke is busy coordinating the annual trip to the March for Life in Washington, D.C. But this year, due to COVID-19 restrictions and concerns about security at the Capitol, the March for Life will be virtual. So Deacon Jose and his wife Miguelina of 38 years are pivoting, like everyone else, but remain committed to being a voice for the unborn. We've been going to the March for Life since 2003. It's been quite a few years since actually uh, my younger kids were very small. Typically, Our Lady of Guadalupe, which now shares worship space at St. Jerome Parish as part of the Catholic Collaborative of Holyoke, fills one to two buses for the annual pro-life pilgrimage, a strong showing for the Diocese of Springfield. Jose and Miguelina have three children who have attended the march with them. In the beginning, when we talk about it, my daughter was about 14 and she said, you know what, I think we need to start doing this. And she said, you guys have never gone. And I think she went to a retreat and she heard about it so much and it sank into her and she came back and that's how we started. So for 17 years, the family took the all night bus ride down to Washington, D.C. and witnessed with fellow parishioners and prayed with thousands of strangers with the same mission of changing hearts and minds on abortion. The pro-life issue is personal to Miguelina, who had her third child, Javier, in her early 40s. I had a choice, according to these other people. No, I did not have a choice. I had a child and that child needed to come to life to this world. This child is 22 years old and he is amazing. He's a wonderful kid. He's part of the youth group. He has a heart that we don't know where it come from, but yes, we do, it come from God. Maybelline and Tony Burgos are also members of Our Lady of Guadalupe and attend the March for Life with the Correas. Tony Burgos is the president of the Knights of Columbus Knights on Bikes for the Diocese of Springfield. Last fall, they held a pro-life bike witness in which he, Maybelline, and others prayed a decade of the rosary at five churches across the diocese. Their last stop was the Shrine of the Holy Innocents, located at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge. The shrine memorializes all children who have died, including those children lost to abortion. The shrine is special to Maybelline, who was open about her own abortion she had when she was 22, years before meeting Tony. I have a duty um, to let the world know um, it's not easy to share this, um, but I know God gave me the strength to do so. Maybelline says she's received healing after attending a Rachel's Vineyard retreat, a post-abortive ministry. 
Maybelline is hoping that by sharing her story, she'll offer encouragement to other women who have gone through the trauma of abortion. She is also hoping that her story will offer encouragement to those women who are facing a crisis pregnancy. They think it's our own body, um, it's our own DNA, and the truth is that it's not. It's not our body, it's not our DNA. So to me, it's important to bring that knowledge to people for everything that I went through when I did it. Um, the process um, from the beginning to the end was horrible. Um, I wish I knew better. And so I am trying to prevent other youth and other women like me to go through that experience, through loss, through suicidal thoughts, to different sexual relations. Um, this all comes through abortion. Tony, an Army veteran, says Maybelline's witness is heroic, and he says she sets the example for him and all men to step up. I have to be, just like St. Joseph, be there for him. Uh, Jesus wasn't his child, but he protected him all along. Tony says he's proud to be part of the Knights of Columbus, which has an ultrasound initiative. The Knights raise money to buy ultrasound machines for local crisis pregnancy centers like this one, New Direction, in North Adams. Maybelline says she wishes she had the opportunity to see the ultrasound before her abortion. Now that we have been sharing this with Knights of Columbus, with our parishes, with uh, Rachel's Vineyard, uh, the healing, it comes from God. So it's... It's something that you have to share the pain to be healed. Just after Christmas, Massachusetts lawmakers passed abortion expansion legislation, which lowers the age of consent from 18 to 16 and allows abortion past 24 weeks in certain circumstances to include a lethal fetal anomaly and to preserve a woman's physical or mental health. While Maybelline says abortion creates heartache for women, she, along with Tony and the Correa, say they will continue to pray for hearts to be changed and for eyes to be opened and for everyone to see the abortion issue not as a political one, but as one of human rights. The sanctity of life is so important that as Christians, we have to defend it. And we have to defend it because life is from conception all the way up into the end, until we die. And who better than protect the unborn than us Christians, because we have to stand for what's right. If we don't defend the unborn, who's going to do this? Mm. Reporting for Real to Real, I'm Carolee McGrath. While the COVID-19 virus continues to affect people and sadly claiming more lives, there is hope to slow the progress with the vaccines that are now being distributed. Mercy Medical Center, in conjunction with Trinity Health of New England, kicked off a series this week of webinars informing people on the COVID-19 vaccine. And joining me now to talk more about the vaccine's rollout is Dr. Robert Roos, Chief Medical Officer at Mercy Medical Center. Hello, Dr. Roos. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Sharon. Well, it's been a little over a month now that we've seen people getting the COVID-19 vaccine, and I know many people are anxiously awaiting their turn. What can you tell us about the timeline for those still waiting? What I can tell you is that we are amidst a very exciting time here with the COVID vaccine rollout, not just in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but across the entire Northeast and country. And we know that people are eager, enthusiastic, and anxious uh, to take advantage of receiving their vaccines. And that's a very, very good thing. Right now, as of this moment in, in Massachusetts, we are in the middle of what the Department of Public Health has called phase one. And what that means is that the focus right now is on vaccinating healthcare workers that are closest to potential exposure to COVID itself. And we expect that in February, sometime either in the middle or perhaps later end of the month that the Department of Public Health will move into phase two where there will be more community members invited and eligible to receive vaccinations. So at the moment, you know, I encourage people to, to keep that enthusiasm, but to be patient. You know, we are moving as quickly as we can and we are subject to the guidance from the Department of Public Health. Let's talk about the vaccine safety. Who should get it? And is there anyone who shouldn't get it? And how do you know? The good news is that the two vaccines and the two more that are expected are all very safe. 
they are very effective and they have very few reasons why people would not be eligible to get them based on their own health conditions. The one contraindication, as we call it, the one reason why somebody would not accept or, or be eligible to receive a vaccine is if they have a documented severe allergy that could include shortness of breath or closing up of the airway to the elements in the vaccine itself. Short of that, if you have an allergy to something else, it does not mean that you can't take the vaccine. It just might mean that you should discuss it with your healthcare provider or be under some more monitoring during the process of the receipt of the vaccine. I know at least in Massachusetts anyway, we're all kind of just waiting for our turn, but is there a way for those of us to sign up somewhere? And when will we see the big rollout to the pharmacies like CVS and Stop and Shop? So it's a great question. There's a lot happening really quickly. Um, so things are changing sometimes day by day, but certainly week by week. The best place to get the most up-to-date information about when you are eligible for vaccination is at the Department of Public Health's website. That's www.mass.gov slash vaccine. Mass.gov slash vaccine can give you information on when you are eligible, locations for vaccination, and so forth. You can also receive information about where you could sign up for a vaccine at Mercy Medical Center or at one of our Trinity Health of New England facilities at www.trinityhealthofne.org slash vaccine. Over the next several weeks, we will hear more from the state about opening up what they're calling mass vaccination sites. The intention is that people will have multiple sites that they can receive the vaccine and uh, those will be available in doctor's offices and pharmacies and others, I would expect by the end of February. And once we receive the vaccine, will we be able to stop wearing a mask and social distancing? So one of the th questions that continues to come up is, you know, once somebody receives a vaccine is if they can go back to life as it was in the past. And at this point, the answer is not quite yet. We, need at this point um, some more scientific data on a couple of points. The first is that we want to ensure that the vaccine is effective to, tr to, to eliminate any sort of spread of the coronavirus. We know that the vaccine is absolutely extremely effective in preventing somebody who's exposed from getting sick, but we want to make sure that there's no possibility that the virus can still be transmitted amongst people even if they're not getting sick with the, with the virus due to the vaccine. Additionally, we wanna make sure that we protect everyone in the community. It's a, it's a core principle of our mission here to, to, to ensure that we have reverence for all life and that we take care of all of the population, including the vulnerable and marginalized. And what that means is that we must continue to practice the same public health guidelines of masking, of distancing, of limiting our gatherings until we know that there is sufficient immunity amongst the entire community, such that we start to see the infection rates go dramatically down. When that happens, that's when we will start to um, you know, change the practices, remove the masks, go back to life as it were. And that's gonna take several more months from this point forward. All right, Dr. Robert Roos, Chief Medical Officer at Mercy Medical Center in Springfield. Thanks so much for your time, and we are all looking forward to the day when we can breathe that collective sigh of relief. Thank you for having me, Sharon. With the approaching general public stage of the COVID-19 vaccine distribution, we have created a special page on diospringfield.org with frequently asked questions and other critical information, including ethical questions. And still to come on Real to Real, Rebecca Drake reports on the Christchild Society and its Western Massachusetts chapter. And Kathy Harrington will introduce us to the new Executive Director of Providence Ministries in Holyoke. These stories are still to come on Real to Real. Last week, I got my vaccine for the COVID virus. I wouldn't have done so without doing the full research and checking with the top moral theologians, 
All our information is on the Dio Springfield website. Uh, I had a little, little uh, soreness where the shot went in, but no other effects. I feel like it's really an important thing to do for the common good, to get as many people vaccinated so we can say an end to coronavirus, put this pandemic in the rearview mirror and get back to better. So I encourage you, get your vaccine as soon as you're able to. The Chalice of Salvation, your weekly spiritual connection. My passion is Brother Terrence Galen, your Chalice host, inviting you to take time out of a busy day and join us Sunday morning. We welcome Father Jonathan Reardon as our Mass presider and celebrate the third Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Chalice of Salvation, Sunday mornings at 10 on 22 News, WWLP, and coming up next on Fox 23, WXXA. Providence Place, owned by the Sisters of Providence, an ideal rental setting for retirees to continue their active, independent lifestyles. We have bright one and two bedroom apartments, a magnificent chapel with daily mass, restaurant style dining, and wellness and entertainment programs. Call for a tour, 413-534-9700. Mom, call me when you're not so busy. The story of Mary Virginia Merrick may not be familiar to most Catholics, but thanks to East Long Meadow parishioner Chuck Alfano, the organization founded by this young disabled Catholic woman is bringing the mission of supporting young children and families to Western Massachusetts. In a story produced before the pandemic, Rebecca Drake highlights the efforts of the local Christ Child Society to provide basic necessities and educational supplies to infants and children in need. It's a familiar story, a child born into poverty, unnoticed by the world. But as word spreads, others of both high and lowly estates recognize the face of God in the child and come to honor the baby with special gifts. However, this story did not end 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. It continues today through the legacy of Mary Virginia Merrick, foundress of the National Christ Child Society and the efforts of local parishioner Chuck Alfano. Well, I was browsing the uh, computer one day, the Vatican website, and I came across her uh, name as being uh, listed under Servants of God. So it intrigued me, she was an American, so I looked it up and I did some research on her. Mary Virginia Merrick was born on November 2nd, 1866 in Washington, D.C. Devoutly Catholic, even as a young child, she became paralyzed as a result of an accident at age 14. Still, at age 20, after her parents' deaths left her to care for her six siblings, her desire to serve the poor led her to formally establish the National Christ Child Society. I was just amazed at what this woman was able to do. She spent 68 years bedridden due to an accident, paralyzed. And in those 68 years, she, she uh, performed almost miracles in the things that she did for children. Chuck did more research, contacted the National Office of the Christ Child Society, and worked to form the Christ Child Society of Western Massachusetts, which was incorporated early in 2019. The first activity of this new chapter was a book drive held at Chuck's parish, St. Michael's in East Long Meadow. We collected over 800 books. And our intent is, first of all, to go through them to make sure they're appropriate, then we uh, will set them up by age group, and then we'll give them to children and to schools and to other organizations that might need them. Local volunteers also have been working on the seminal program of the Christ Child Society, one that helps support children right from the beginning, when they are born. This program began when founder Mary Virginia Merrick, already paralyzed, heard of a young mother living in poverty with a newborn baby. So she and a couple of her friends decided they were going to knit a layette and provide a blanket, perhaps, and other things that this woman might need. And from there, from that one individual, today, the Christ Child Society nationally 
gave out 33,000 layettes last year around the country, and it's growing more and more. As the local Christchild chapter has continued to expand its efforts to support children and families with books, clothing, and other necessities, Chuck credits the support of his parish and his pastor, Father Wayne Biernot, who in turn has praise for Chuck. If there's one thing I've learned about Chuck Alfano is that he is an amazing blessing for our parish family. And it's just remarkable to see how Christ's light and love emanates from his heart in humility. Father Wayne also has praise for St. Michael's parishioners who helped make the book drive a success and who recognize the importance of supporting children and young families. And so I am very grateful for Chuck. I'm very grateful for all of our parishioners. I'm humbled to serve as the spiritual advisor. And I'm just excited to see how God blesses this kind of kindness and generosity and to see where the Holy Spirit leads us. And the Holy Spirit has been at work in the Christchild Society during the last two years, as Chuck and his volunteers connect with other Catholic agencies in their outreach efforts. We all have the same uh, intentions of helping poor children and helping with their reading, helping young mothers who need support after a childbirth. Looking to the future, Chuck's hope is to increase the presence of the Christchild Society in the Springfield Diocese. My goal is to have us involved in every parish in the diocese someday. I hope I'm around to see that. And as the Christchild Society expands its reach in western Massachusetts, the members continue to see the Christ child in every child. For Real to Real, I'm Rebecca Drake. The pandemic hasn't stopped the good work of the Christ Child Society of Western Massachusetts. In the last year, volunteers have provided books and arts and crafts supplies for children in Springfield South End and clothing for infants in local shelters and hospitals. The organization now has its own office space in East Long Meadow, and Alfano has been elected to the board of directors of the National Christ Child Society. To find out how you can help the local chapter, we have more at iobserve.org. Providence Ministries for the Needy has also navigated the difficulties of 2020 while continuing to serve the communities depending on them. As Kathy Harrington reports, the challenges included record demands for services and a critical change in leadership. Reacting to the spread of COVID-19, parishes in Western Massachusetts closed last March. The pews were empty, but the work of the church continued. We have taken such pride in how we've reacted to this pandemic from the second that COVID hit in March. Jenny Adamczyk is the new executive director of Providence Ministries. As one of the ministries supported by the annual Catholic Appeal, their work in the community happens around the clock, 365 days a year. The protective care of God, that's the definition of providence, especially right now, the outstretched hands of God's protection are what's needed for the communities served by Providence Ministries. Kate's Kitchen is one of the programs operated by Providence Ministries. Every day from noon until two, a hot meal is served in their Holyoke dining room to anyone seeking one. We shifted, so now we're doing to-go style. Um, we serve through the door. So after COVID hit, the meals continued with a reduced crew of volunteers. The dining room closed and after the departure of their executive director. Jenny Adamsik stepped in to fill the gap and help Kate's Kitchen meet the sharp increase in guests. Uh, we were averaging about 150 to 180 people a day that we'd be serving, we can go up to 240 people in a day. Adamsik says the warm meal and the extras for people to take home to be sure there is something to eat later on continue with every effort taken to limit exposure for community members and the volunteers. Working with the elementary school a block away, the youngest of Kate's Kitchen's guests are served, children who aren't normally needing food during the day. We were seeing more children come to Kate's Kitchen. Uh, we would have parents come with their children, and we would have some children just come alone. You're talking five, seven-year-olds holding hands, walking down to come and eat. Operating in Kate's Kitchen is Foodworks, a culinary training program. 
After completing the 12-week class, students earn Serve Safe certificates and learn the skills needed to find employment in the food industry. So we were able to run our first wave of Food Works last year because of when it ended in the spring when COVID was hitting. We were not able to graduate, have a graduation because of COVID. Uh, and then we put that program on hold. Across the parking lot from Kate's Kitchen is Providence Ministries Food Pantry. Named for its founder, Sister of Providence, Margaret McCleary, Margaret's Pantry serves every community in Western Massachusetts, except Springfield. A challenging feat in normal times, but in this time of COVID, the demand for food doubled. We've had bare shelves. There's been times where we're not sure. We, we just were saying at the staff meeting, it's loaves and fish. You know, every time we think that there's not going to be enough, another food drive happens, another donation is made, and so we've been able to continue that service uninterrupted. St. Jude's Closet is located next to the food pantry and offers clothing and small household goods at a low cost. But for the safety of volunteers and community members, it closed for a few months. The thrift store is now open again two days a week, but there's a limit to 10 people um, in the thrift store. They have to have masks on, uh, so that's controlled. Moving the administrative offices into Laredo House, Adam Six says she's more in touch with the community being served by Providence Ministries. It didn't make sense to be in charge of the programs and be in a completely different location than where the programs were operating. We needed to be there and see what was going on to see how we can help, how we can assist. Laredo House, McCleary Manor, and Broderick House are the housing programs of Providence Ministries. Here at Laredo House, we have really your stage kind of one people coming in from detox, they're coming from uh, different sobriety programs, and from prison. They're coming right from jail. And we give them a soft place to land, a, uh, an opportunity to get themselves back on their feet. And then Broderick and McCleary are single room occupancy houses. So once you've been here for a year um, and you haven't had any issues, uh, relapse issues, behavioral issues, you're eligible to move to one of the other two houses based on availability. Residents are encouraged to find work and take part in group sessions to regain their independence. But COVID closed the doors of the residential houses to incoming residents and brought on tighter restrictions to help keep the buildings COVID free until November. We did have um, a COVID incident here, but we were able to contain it and isolate it and no other residents got sick off of that uh, isolated incident. So that was also, and we haven't had any active cases since. Since moving her office into Laredo House, subtle changes have been made. Changes to give the residents a reason to take pride in living there. I think the general feel of the building has changed. We were able to do some, uh, some light cosmetic upgrades. Our goal was we wanted to make this feel more like a home. The changes also include opening the kitchen for the men to prepare their own meals, evening Bible studies, and decorating for Christmas. I love that I'm so close to everything that's going on here. It's really interesting how when I look back over all of the things that I've done in my life, it's interesting how God has been in control of every step that I've taken and how it's all led me to be here. Adamzik says this job is her mission and her heart is with the people whose lives are sustained and transformed through Providence Ministries. For Real to Real, I'm Kathy Harrington. And Jenny Adamczyk is working with her staff and FoodWorks to get the culinary training program back in operation. For this week, that's Real to Real. As always, to keep up with all of the latest news on the Catholic Church, both here in the Diocese of Springfield and around the world, check out our news and information site, iobserve.org. Also, you can like us on Facebook at Catholic Communications. And I will see you right back here next week for Real to Real, your window on the world around you. See you then. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation, funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal, and the support of you, our faithful viewers.